Over the last few lessons we've been looking at consensus explanations behind age inequality, but now we're going to turn towards conflict explanations, and first among those is Marxism, and we'll look at how they examine age inequality through the lens of power interests between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, arguing once more that age inequality is not some natural process, but a damaging byproduct of exploitation. So on the one hand, you've got consensus explanations that argue that society is generally based on an agreed set of norms and values, and that if anyone is suffering any kind of inequality, it must be because they're not conforming to that agreed set of norms and values. But today we're going to look at conflict explanations that argue that society is actually based on a division between social groups, and that the power play between these different groups can often lead to inequality. And obviously the most prominent among those uh, conflict explanations is Marxism. Now, when we, when we talk about Marxism, we have to remember their general view of society, and then, then we can go ahead to think about how age inequality fits into that. So we have to remember, if we look back to our video on ethnic inequality, that society is based on this base superstructure. Everything is geared around the capitalist system. It's created by capitalism and it then reinforces capitalism. And it's exactly the same with, with age inequality. And I'm going to go through three studies or, or perspectives, I should say, today um, to go into a bit more detail on that. And we're going to look at political economy theory. We're going to look at Vincent and we're going to look at the reserve army of labor. All of these three kind of concepts make up the broad Marxist view of age inequality. And remember that this is very similar to the ethnic inequality stuff. So if it sounds like you're kind of repeating yourself, you know, it's the same theory. So, you know, you're probably not wrong. For our first Marxist explanation, we should turn to a concept that we're familiar with the reserve army of labour. The Marxist sociologist Byrne, just like he argued with ethnic minorities, argues that the young and the old are used as a large portion of this reserve army of labour of the unemployed. This is because both the young and the elderly can easily be employed when the economy is booming. And we can see this in the form of zero hours contracts where a lot of young and elderly people are taking contracts where they are only really permitted to work when the business requires them to work. Almost a clear statement of the reserve army of labour at the contract level. The sociologist Philipson looked specifically at the elderly and argued that they have been historically used as this reserve army of labour as they have often sought to have an extra income after their retirement. And as the need for an extra income after retirement he claims has grown since the 1980s. This means that more and more often the elderly are used as this reserve army of labour. And because the elderly tend to have a culture of dependency where they don't see themselves as very self-reliant, this means that they can be quite easily exploited and will more readily accept things like zero hours contracts. So overall this means that the reserve army of labour continues to benefit the bourgeoisie and the construction of age only furthers this agenda. So we, we can evaluate the reserve army of labour concept from a number of angles. Um, similar with their explanations in terms of ethnic inequality, we can argue that it does make some solid explanations towards the economic disadvantage suffered by people who are both young or, or old. In particular, you could use the zero hours contracts evidence to support the claim that the young and the old are both more prone to exploitation. You could certainly make that case. On the other hand, though, their kind of problem that they run into is very similar to the functionalist one, actually. Um, because they're both structural macro theories, they both assume a kind of 
homogenous experience of age where everyone experiences age the same way that every young person that every old person is going to suffer some kind of exploitation as they age and we know just like with functionalism that that is not necessarily the case if you are of a higher class if you have a higher skill set if you're better educated that might not necessarily um, be the case for you your ethnicity might also impact your level of you know exploitation and also they fail to recognize on a second point that actually many elderly people are not marginalized and are actually very well respected members of the the workforce you know many elderly people for instance can be very esteemed judges you know it's very common for, for elderly people to take part in politicians tend to be of the more um, elderly persuasion so we say so it's not universal that the elderly are always just consigned to just sit in you know a dark room and rot away the marxist sociologist vincent argues that not only does age inequality perform a nice economic role for capitalism but it also serves a ideological role in justifying the exploitation of various groups he argues that the retirement age itself was purely introduced to benefit the capitalist system as it allows for unemployment to be minimized in a statistical level to make it look like capitalism is working, but it also helps to benefit the many financial companies that sell private pensions, and thereby benefiting the capitalist class itself through extra profit. Also, he argues that there has been a kind of moral panic surrounding aging population in the media, with the media whipping this up as a large financial time bomb but he argues that this is an ideological distraction. He argues that by focusing the attention on the aging population, you distract from other issues which may be more pressing or more structural, such as a fairer welfare system. And he argues that it tends to divert attention from solutions that would require cost to businesses, such as the problem of global warming, for instance. And focusing the attention on the aging population helps to distract from those problems. So, if you were to be favourable towards Vincent, you could argue that he provides a, an attempt, anyway, at explaining the interplay between government policy in regards to age and the kind of vested interests of the capitalist system. You could certainly make that claim if you wanted to. On the other hand, though, we have to acknowledge that there is an inherent flaw with his understanding of the economics behind it all, because... If you really stop and think about it, surely it would benefit capitalism more to actually have the elderly continue to work. It would mean less labour turnover. It would mean that you have a higher workforce. So actually, it doesn't really serve the benefits of many businesses or, or capitalism to have the elderly retire. It seems counterproductive. And also, if you look at it from a postmodernist perspective, you could argue that you know, actually, the elderly are not simply just passive agents anymore, and that they are actually very active members of their community now, whereas perhaps they may not have been before. But certainly today, they are active consumers. They have a lot of purchasing power in the consumer culture. So they do have a lot of influence, and they don't necessarily get marginalized. Um, in the same way as Vincent would argue. Our final perspective is from the neo-Marxist view, so a far more recent Marxist perspective. This is political economy theory. So I forgot to mention the name of the sociologist. His name is Townsend and I was too lazy to plug my microphone back in. That argues that the entire political system is geared to institutionally marginalize the elderly. This is because in order for capitalism to remain as productive as possible, it must consistently keep its workforce young as they tend to be the most productive workers. So therefore, the entire political economic system seeks to lower the status of the elderly and make them have a culture of dependence where they do not feel like they are self-reliant enough to work and therefore step aside for the younger, more productive workers. For example, he argued that the retirement age, for instance, forces the elderly out of the economic system, making them dependent on everyone else, and that this, therefore, means that everyone else views the elderly with suspicion and this lowers the elderly's status. 
as they are seen as dependent and not able to provide for themselves. So, you know, with political economy theory, we basically just have to think of the whole framework of government and the whole framework of the capitalist system as deliberately trying to marginalise and alienate its elderly um, in a way to basically justify other forms of exploitation. So if we're being favourable towards that theory, we could argue that they do make a meaningful attempt to explain the ageism that's prevalent in society. And there's numbers of studies which do show that there is uh, a degree of discrimination based on age. And you can look in your course packs um, to, to get those studies. But again, on the other hand, they fail to recognise that actually the capitalist political economy is actually geared towards the elderly rather than looking to marginalise them. The elderly vote, for instance, in the political system is very influential. You know, the so-called grey vote, as it's called. Um, and also in, in the economic system, the grey pound is incredibly influential. The amount of purchasing power that the elderly have in the broader economy is very um, powerful in many ways. Um, so if anything, you could argue that it's actually more younger generations that may be marginalised by the political economy more so than the elderly. Okay, so final thoughts and notices then. Um, as a kind of brief summary of Marxism, just remember that we ha it's all part of that base superstructure model. So um, all of the concepts that I've outlined here are either showing you how capitalism creates age inequality or how it helps to sustain it. And most of them will say both, you know, that they actually say, for instance, if you look at, at Vincent, they create age inequality through the retirement age. And then this helps to sustain capitalism by kind of diverting attention from capitalism's um, inherent flaws. Now, um, in terms of the way you would kind of use these in an essay, try and think about how these compare to the cultural, sorry, the consensus-based explanations. Um, because it would be really good to try and compare and contrast a lot of these ideas in your evaluation. Um, you know, because I think that could have got people kind of more full marks in the ethnic inequality one. Um, in terms of notices, not, not many, just a kind of reminder that if you're getting emails off another teacher, if they're marking your work, that's entirely normal. Any questions about content or whatever, send them um, my way though still. Um, you know, even if I don't teach you, I'm happy to answer any questions. It's not an issue. Um, the one thing I, I, I would like to say though in terms of notices is if you're trying to contact me about an essay or um, anything where you need a response, you know, even if you're sending me marking, if you can't access it via Moodle, I would probably send it to me via Teams because, you know, I'm getting so many emails at the moment that I'm just forgetting to respond to a, a good 60 plus percent because, um, you know, the spam coming into my inbox is just um, breaking my internet. So, um, but on Teams, I'm far, it's far quicker for me to respond. Um, I've got it on my phone so I can respond 24 hours. Um, whereas email I have to log on. So um, I, I would, if you can, contact me through Teams. You know, it's, it, you get a lot of quicker responses and um, it, you know, saves me the stress of having to sift through my email inbox. Um, um, yeah, I'll see you on, what day is it today? This is the Wednesday lesson, so I'll see you on Friday.